Okay. Uh, so we'll go through a bit of an outline. We'll talk of, uh, we'll do a bit in, of an introduction. We'll talk about imaging of the uh, facial skeleton. I uh, spend most of the time sort of reviewing some facial fracture patterns because I know it can be a very complicated and daunting area. And then summarize all of that at the end with a nice sort of approach on how to tackle uh, some of these. So motor vehicle uh, crashes and interpersonal assaults are bar brawls and that sort of thing usually account for the vast majority of the patients that we see coming into the emergency department with, uh, with facial fractures. We image these patients obviously after they've been stabilized. So initial management with ABCs needs to occur first. Uh, and of course, if there are other more serious injuries that are going on, attention really should be paid to those first. Uh, but with m our multiple injured patients, the vast majority of these people are getting evaluated in one comprehensive examination when there are multiple areas that need to be evaluated simultaneously. So our cl the clinical goals from our colleagues are going to be obviously preservation of life followed by restoration of form and function. Uh, and on imaging side, we will assess form by looking at the fracture patterns uh, and seeing where the fracture fragments have been moved to and assessing function by figuring out what other injuries we have going on with the soft tissues, particularly things like the orbit, the, the mouth, the nose, the lacrimal system, uh, and the sinuses. So uh, let's talk about imaging of, uh, of these injuries. And radiographs no longer used. Uh, cell phones, I think, have replaced these. So if you see the dagger handle sticking out of the head, you know, I'm sure someone's going to get a picture of that, and I always want that for my teaching file. Uh, but now I can only, I can use the scout views for those. So we're not doing the radiographs anymore, and everything that scared our residents uh, back in the day with, uh, with x-rays and so on have now really been replaced with CT and a lot of use of 3D CT. It's very, very helpful for some of these areas that are much more complicated uh, anatomy. So CT is very good at evaluating both the bone and the soft tissue injuries uh, in, the, in the facial uh, trauma patient. It's cost saving compared with uh, doing um, uh, radiographs of the face and mandible and the radiation dose is still well below the thre threshold for cataract formation. Now typically we scan the face and the mandible as one unit. Uh, we go from the hyoid bone, if you pick something below the chin, uh, that way the tech doesn't cut off the chin, and we go to above the uh, frontal sinuses. and we occasionally will do an isolated mandible because we are also, uh, we have a prison ward in our, our hospital at Bellevue. Um, and so these guys like to pop each other's jaw every so often just to have a little change of scenery and come down and visit us in radiology. Um, and they do this enough that we'll just limit the study to the mandible when we know that that's really, really what they have. Um, some of the multiplanar reformations that we can do, uh, we can do a Panorex uh, type reconstruction. It's a little bit more work. Um, and if provided there's not a significant cant or tilt on the mandible, they'll work out nicely and, and some of the surgeons who are, you know, that when you have oral maxillofacial guys who are covering uh, facial trauma those nights, they, they particularly like these. Um, but otherwise it's just as easy or easier rather to do uh, the oblique sagittals for one side or the other to lay out the angle fracture, show them how it traverses um, where, the, uh, where the facial or where the inferior alveolar nerve goes through uh, and to show them that relationship. And as well for the orbits, uh, I like to do the oblique sagittal as well when there are fractures that involve uh, the orbital floor or the orbital roof uh, so that they can get a better sense on a pure sagittal uh, of the globe um, to see the involvement of the rectus muscles and, uh, and the optic nerve. And then, of course, there's 3D reconstructions, which can really put together the big picture uh, for the surgeons, and they particularly like this as uh, sort of the more global uh, seeing the forest for the trees sort of images. All right, so let's talk a little bit about biomechanics uh, and understanding areas that are susceptible to low G-forces, which would happen in interpersonal assaults, injuries that you'll see with a fist. Um, and these are also happen to be the prominent areas of the face, the nose, the cheekbones, uh, and those are areas that are going to be broken from more interpersonal assaults, whereas it's going to take a, more of a car crash or a significant fall or construction-type accident to get areas uh, that require high G-forces in order to fracture, that being the maxilla and particularly the frontal bones uh, much tougher uh, to break. About a 30 mile per hour crash, though, uh, will overcome all of these, these numbers. Uh, the numbers, according to the literature, are actually slightly lower uh, in women than in men. The maxilla, in particular, though, is sensitive to uh, a horizontal impact uh, and the mandible more vulnerable to a lateral impact, uh, so the right hook or the left hook is more likely to uh, wind up breaking the mandible. Uh, soft tissues can help absorb some of the impact energy as well. So let's spend some time going through the different facial fractures uh, so that we get familiar with all of these. Uh, 
Uh, one of the best take-home signs that's out there, and it's great for the residents, particularly on call, uh, is the clear sinus sign. And that is if your facial, uh, if your paranasal sinuses and your mastoid aerosols are free of fluid uh, and clear, then really the only facial fractures that you would have would be nasal bones and zygomatic arches. And if you include the mandible in your scan, uh, then the mandible is fair game as well. So anything that has a wall up against a sinus is going to invariably cause hemorrhage uh, into that sinus when, the, when that wall is broken. Uh, so this is a very good tool to sort of get through some of that volume very quickly. So we have separated the facial fractures uh, anatomically. So we have nasal bones, uh, the nasal orbital ethmoid fractures, and I'll explain what all that is, uh, frontal sinus fractures, orbital fractures, zygoma fractures, maxillary and mandibular fractures. So when we look at the anatomy of the nasal bones, we have the nasal bone proper here that I've shown in purple. In behind that, we have the frontal process of the maxilla that comes up and forms uh, the wall behind that. Uh, and then we have the more fragile bones behind that. We have the lacrimal bones and the ethmoid bones. Uh, we have the nasal septum, which has a cartilaginous and osseous component, uh, and the overlying soft tissues. Now, the most common injuries that we'll see are from a lateral force. Uh, on this coronal image, you can see the nasal bones getting displaced to one side. So this person's hit by a uh, punched by a righty to the left side of the face, displacing the nasal bones over towards the right. Uh, an inferior directed force, like an uppercut, will more likely fracture the nasal septum. Uh, so we can see that as well. And then the uh, frontal impact is the toughest one in order to break the nasal bones because, as you can see, you've got that thicker area of bone from that uh, frontal process of the maxilla that comes up behind. And that makes that area a little tougher and a little more resistant to, uh, to fracturing as easily. But once you overcome that, there isn't a lot holding things back. You've got those very, very fragile medial orbital wall bones, um, and those tend to telescope, and that drives us into the nasal orbital ethmoid territory. When we describe nasal bone fractures, we don't, we don't classify these, but do these are features that you would want to discuss in your uh, description about whether they are displaced or undisplaced, whether the septum is involved, and whether there's any telescoping involved, and of course, whether the injury is unilateral or bilateral. So this is just there for understanding the features that you would want to discuss. And then we get to the nasal orbital ethmoid, or the NOE uh, territory, and this anatomy is simply, it's really the interorbital space, the space between the eyes. And it's bound by the cribriform plate above, uh, the lower border of the ethmoid sinus below, and the medial orbital walls as the lateral margins. Uh, and we have a lot of structures that run through here. We've got the lacrimal sac, nasolacrimal duct, the medial canthal ligaments that anchor the eye in on, on medially, and we have a tremendously good blood supply that flows in and around this area. So we can lead to a lot of complications. To get this injury, you get an, a direct impact to the upper nasal bridge, okay, which you can still overcome with, uh, with low G-forces, so interpersonal assaults can still do this. And again, there's very little resistance. Once you've overcome the nasal bones and those frontal process of the maxilla, everything tends to get pushed back. Uh, and so we can see these injuries as part of the uh, low G-force type injuries, or you can see them in high G-force injuries, often combined with upper Lefort injuries. So what we have here uh, are, are injuries where we have fractures in between the eyes, the interorbital space, uh, and on that bone that's in the medial area, that's where that medial canthal ligament that anchors the eye in medially is located. And clinically, these patients may look like their eye, one eye is drifting out laterally. Surgeons want to know how comminuted this is to get an idea as to whether they have to find the ligament and repair it or whether the bone pieces are large enough that the attachment is probably intact of that ligament and they, if they fix the bone, they will have uh, fixed the ligament. So it's something they'll look for is really just how big are the fragments uh, in this area. So here's a 3D CT of that injury, and on the uh, mid-sagittal plane, you can see the, the telescoping and the impaction uh, that's happening in, in the mid-face there. One of the complications that you can have is if you break the cribriform plate uh, and patients, say, get bagged at the scene where, when EMS come to evaluate them and so on, some of that air can be going north uh, into the cranial vault, and you can have what we call tension pneumocephalus, uh, you've got a fixed volume for your brain, your CSF, your blood vessels, and if you introduce something quickly in that space, including air, uh, you can have mass effect. And we see that uh, appearance on the top of the ventricles uh, and, and an air CSF level here. Uh, that's referred to as the Mount Fuji sign, and sometimes you'll also see these post-neurosurgical procedures as well. Uh, and in July, when you've got the new residents coming and somebody's trying to pass the NG tube, 
uh, and the chromoform plate is broken and you tell them to just keep going till they meet resistance, uh, they, they may wind up with this. But this is uh, something hopefully no one ever sees. This is from trauma.org. This is not one of our cases, thankful, thank God, uh, where the nasogastric tube went up into the brain. When we look at the frontal sinus, uh, typically the anterior wall is quite thick. The posterior table of that frontal sinus is usually thin. Uh, the sinuses, there's a tremendous variability in the size of the sinus, and about 4% of people actually have no frontal sinus. And what we'll often see is a large sinus, you're going to more likely have the fracture isolated to the anterior table because you've got a larger surface area to distribute that force through. Whereas the small uh, sinuses are more likely to propagate from the anterior to posterior table, and we can see the pneumocephalus in this patient as well. And of course, once you break that posterior table, now you're into the intracranial space. Uh, this does require an awful lot of force. This is one of those high G-force areas that's going to take a motor vehicle crash or significant construction accident uh, or fall in order to do. Um, and to apply that kind of force to the upper forehead, uh, is often going to result in a hyperextension injury of the cervical spine. So it's something to keep in mind uh, when you're evaluating both the face and the cervical spine in that patient. So once we break that posterior table of the frontal sinus and displace it by its own thickness, which is really one to two millimeters in thickness, you've now exposed the CSF uh, to your sinuses, which can be uh, an, an unhealthy environment for that, so a big risk for infection. We can have epidural abscesses, CSF leaks, meningitis, and that usually dictates that neurosurgery needs to join your facial surgeons in there uh, in order to deal with this operatively. When we come to the orbit, we've got seven bones that make up the bony orbit, and we don't memorize them all, three apertures in the back. Uh, but rather than memorizing them, we look at the uh, walls of the orbit. So we have orbital floor, uh, which has typical injuries that we'll see, medial wall, lateral wall, and orbital roof. And so that's usually how we will describe injuries as to which one of these walls uh, is involved, and we'll go through each of these in time. Uh, so we can have blowout fractures, which typically occur in the orbital floor or the medial wall, or both, um, and they're considered pure if the rim is intact, but it's not a feature I typically will uh, comment on in the reports. Uh, we can have non-blowout fractures, but your orbital roof can blow in or blow up, uh, depending on the direction of the force. Lateral walls may be associated with zygoma fractures. Medial walls can be associated with the NOE fractures we just talked about or the upper Lefort fractures in higher energy injuries. So typically what we'll see with a blowout fracture of the orbital floor uh, is we see something that we call the free fragment sign. Uh, and this is on your axial images when you see a piece of bone that isn't connected to one of the walls and it's typically in, uh, sitting in some hemorrhagic fluid in the sinus. Uh, you can be sure that when you get to your coronal images, you're going to see the floor is broken out, and uh, you want to look to see where that inferior rectus muscle is going and how big the defect is. Uh, same thing with the medial orbital wall on the axial images. You should have a nice, clean, thin line uh, that runs vertically uh, on that image, uh, separating the, the ethmoid air cells from the orbital cavity, and when you have uh, depression of that and, and hemorrhage on, on the uh, ethmoid side, uh, you have a medial orbital wall fracture, which, again, you can uh, confirm on your... Uh, coronal reformations. And we can have patients that do both and have the medial orbital wall and the floor fractures, but on the patient's left side, there is no hemorrhage in the sinuses, uh, so that's the remote fracture, but it's a Saturday night in New York, so we have the matching injury uh, on, the, on the acute side on the patient's right side. So he was hit by a lefty tonight, he was hit by the righty before, and this is our typical Saturday night special in New York. Uh, these guys keep visiting us uh, and lose all their fights. Uh, we can have the blow-in fracture, so these are more forehead uh, frontal bone injuries uh, that propagate down and uh, cause, sorry, uh, and particularly in this guy, uh, the orbital roof getting blown in, into the orbit. And these are going to be associated with intracranial injuries. This was a guy who was playing soccer with his, quote, friends, um, and he was going after the ball and somebody else was going after the ball. He was diving for it and someone else went after it with their foot, and their foot met his head. Um, and he's got severe frontal contusions that you can see going along with this uh, terrible, terrible case. Uh, you can also have blow-up fractures where the orbital roof, which is the floor, obviously, to the anterior cranial fossa, fossa gets uh, driven uh, intracranially, which also will do the same thing as opposed to your table fracture. You assume that the dura has been breached. You've now exposed, again, uh, your CSF and, uh, and meninges uh, to the outside world, uh, and so there's certainly risk for infection with those. And we look at the soft tissues, including the globe, so we can look for foreign bodies. This one's easy. Some of them are a little 
uh, tougher to appreciate clinically. High energy things can get right through the globe, uh, penetrate it, and leave almost no telltale signs clinically, and we may see a BB or some other metal fragment sitting uh, deeper uh, in the globe. You can dislocate the lens if you rip the zonular fibers that, that support it, and it will fall with gravity, assuming you're scanning these patients on their back. Um, hemorrhage within the globe with the high attenuation in there, and we can have globe rupture uh, where it, this has an appearance, what we call the flat tire sign or the mushroom sign. Uh, the intraocular pressure is a little bit higher than the intraorbital pressure, so there is that tendency for the vitreous humor to escape and collapse the globe uh, with these sorts of injuries. When it comes to the cheekbone, the zygoma, there's different names out there. People used to refer to these as the tripod fractures, and then other people said, well, really, there's four attachments for the zygoma that fracture, so it really should be a tetrapod. Everybody got confused, so now they just call them ZMC fractures or zygomatical maxillary complex fractures. ZMC is a little easier to say. Um, but what happens with this bone typically in, in the low energy uh, injuries is that you basically disarticulate it from its neighbors, and so you'll fracture across the maxillary suture line, across the uh, zygomatical frontal suture, across the zygomatical temporal suture, and then inside the orbit with uh, the greater wing of sphenoid. So it tends to disarticulate itself. With higher energy, you will actually fracture the bone itself as well. Mm -hmm. Typically what we'll see on the axial images and the coronal images, you'll get the sense that uh, this piece of bone is getting pushed uh, medially uh, and posteriorly because that's usually the force uh, of, the, of the fist or whatever it is that's driving it in, in that particular direction. Uh, and they're usually pretty evident. Again, on the 3D, we can see uh, the fracturing of all of those uh, articulations uh, with, the other, uh, with the other bones. Uh, and that's the acute one on the patient's left and the repaired one on the patient's right. Another Saturday night in New York hit by the lefty before and tonight hit by the righty. If you see the boxer's fracture coming in concurrently, you make sure that the ER keeps those guys separate because there'll just be more of this. So always on the lookout for these things. Uh, when it comes to the maxilla, uh, we talk about buttresses, and I never understood what that was for the longest period of time. But the buttresses are simply the thicker areas of the facial skeleton, and they typically thicken up in response to the muscles of mastication acting on the growing facial skeleton. So as we chew as kids, that bone that, that harbors uh, the attachments of those muscles thickens up in response to that. And so these are the areas where the surgeons ultimately want to place their hardware or their screws, because that's going to be the area where you can actually uh, hold a screw because the rest of it is very thin walls often that surround the sinuses. So the thicker areas are the vertical buttresses. We have the nasofrontal buttress, the zygomatic buttress, and posteriorly a, a pterygomaxillary buttress. We have horizontal buttresses as well that go over the apices of the teeth and then uh, over and below uh, the orbits and extend across the zygomatic arch. And when we talk about the maxilla as well, we have the alveolus and the maxillary teeth uh, to consider as well. So uh, back in 1901, Rene Lefort didn't have the internet or, or TV and was bored, so he uh, dropped anvils out of his window onto cadaver skulls below just to see what would happen. Uh, and he described his three fractures, which we'll go through here. Um, so the Lefort one is a transverse fracture that uh, sits low down uh, above the apices of the teeth. The Lefort two is the pyramidal fracture going across midline. And the Lefort three is a high transverse fracture uh, that, that goes through the level of the orbits and breaks the zygomatic arch. The thing they all have in common is they all come out through the pterygoid plates posteriorly. So let's tackle each one of these uh, individually again. So transverse fracture for the Lefort 1, it goes through all the walls of the maxillary sinus, breaks the nasal septum, and the pterygoid plates as we move posteriorly. On the axial images, excuse me, at one level you will see fractures going through the anterior wall, the medial maxillary walls, and the posterior lateral walls of the maxillary sinus, and you'll see fractures of the pterygoid plates. That's your hallmark that you're dealing with a uh, Lefort fracture. And this clinically results in a free-floating hard palate, so if your patients have teeth, unlike ours, you can grab them by the front teeth and move the palate independent of the nose. Used to be something that was done clinically. Now it's just a CT. Uh, on your coronal images, you can follow that fracture plane all the way from anterior to posterior. You see it going through uh, the region of the, the nasal region and extending all the way back through the pterygoid plates. Same plane. Uh, it's very easy to identify on your coronals doing that. The Lefort II is the pyramidal fracture that goes up across the maxilla, crosses the medial orbital walls, crosses the, uh, the nasal bones, and then back down the opposite side. And it has to come out posteriorly through the pterygoid plates. On some images here, we can see there's fractures through the anterior maxillary walls. We see the lateral maxillary walls here. The fracture's going up to extend through the inferior orbital rims as it comes up. Has to go across midline, and then it comes uh, also backward through the pterygoid plates. 
on the 3D, it's very nice again for the surgeons to get again the, the big picture. Uh, and you can see the Lefort 2 fracture pattern uh, following the rules pretty well here, as well as the Lefort 1 fracture pattern, slightly obliqued here. But again, it gives the surgeons that very global view that they need uh, to help sort of get the case started when, when they know where all the pieces are and where the fragments and where the fracture lines are going. The Lefort 3 complete craniofacial disjunction in order to separate the face from the cranial vaults, you've got to go across the level of the orbits and you have to break the zygomatic arches, which is unique uh, to the Lefort 3s. And ultimately it comes out again through the pterygoid plates posteriorly. So we'll see here we've got fractures involving the medial orbital walls as we cross the midline. We have the lateral orbital walls as we move out laterally. Again, another unique feature. It's going to break the zygomatic arches, which I don't show you here, uh, and then come back down through the pterygoid plates. So <clears throat> these are the, uh, the lines that we would see both from the frontal view and from a, uh, a sagittal view on these. And uh, here's a patient that's done a whole bunch of combination fractures. If we look, we see the pterygoid plates are fractured, and then we're going to look for each of the individual pterygoid, uh, in the, each of the individual Lefort fractures. We'll see here fractures to the anterior maxillary walls, medial walls, poster lateral walls. So we have Lefort 1s. We keep looking inferior orbital rims, uh, which would probably be better seen on coronals. Uh, and for Lefort 3s and, and Lefort 2s, we cross the midline with the medial orbital walls being broken. Plus we have lateral orbital walls and we have zygomatic arches. We actually have all three Leforts bilaterally here. And that's how we would report this bilateral Lefort 1s, Lefort 2s, and Lefort 3s. Here it is on the 3D, uh, and you can sort of dissect this down, and you can see your transverse fracture above the apices of the teeth. And when I rip part of the mandible off on the lateral view, you can see how that fracture extends posteriorly through to the pterygoid plates. Uh, the Lefort 2 pyramidal fracture coming up across midline and back down, uh, and that's the pattern it would make on the, on the lateral projection. And then uh, the Lefort 3 is, again, complete craniofacial separation. This is the crumple zone of the face. Uh, they like the crumple zone of your car to take the impact to preserve the brain. Uh, and then, again, that's the pattern it would take on the lateral view. So face protects brain just like the crumple zone of your car. If you keep all your injuries below the orbital rims, uh, the superior orbital rims, rather, you will more likely than not preserve your brain. Um, and so the face will take the hit for it. And in this patient, we can see tremendous facial injuries, uh, injury to the globe. Uh, the brain was pristine. When they repair these, as I alluded to before, they will place the hardware in places of the, uh, of the uh, buttresses, and we can see that a lot of that hardware falls across the lines of the buttresses, uh, and so that really does sort of guide how they're going to fix these patients. You can have Leforts that are not symmetric as well, so you may want to just consider one side versus the other side. Uh, and we can see here Lefort 1's going across, Lefort 2 coming across, and when we look for Lefort 3's, we only have it on the left side, and we would report that as bilateral 1's, 2's, and a left hemi Lefort 3. Uh, we also have the uh, maxilla to consider and the teeth. We typically name the teeth because we have facial surgeons, oral and maxillofacial surgeons, uh, plastic surgeons, ENT, uh, everybody that under the sun covers some of these patients, and so everybody has a different scheme uh, for naming or numbering the teeth, but if we name them with this, everybody's on the same page with it. Uh, you can fracture the tooth as well. Um, and we'll get very quickly through the mandible here. It's the only part that has a joint in it. Uh, it typically, uh, it, it sort of functions like a ring and sometimes, so there's often a second fracture about two-thirds of the time, but not always. Uh, and we can see the joint over here. If the fracture goes through the root of the tooth, it's considered an open fracture, which makes it a very dirty fracture. So it's got to be very well irrigated and covered with antibiotics when they have these. Most of the time, again, we will have about two-thirds of the time, we'll have a second fracture, uh, but not always. So when I see one, I always look for a second fracture, though it may not be there. The pull of the masseter muscle and the other muscles of mastication can either make the fracture look very obvious and displace it, or it can reduce it beautifully and make it very, very difficult to see. So you want to make sure that you burn through the cortex when you're adjusting your windows and levels so the cortex is just a little bit gray and not overwhelmingly uh, bright white so that you can see some of the undisplaced fractures. Typically, the condylar heads will be pulled immediately from the pull of the medial, uh, or rather the lateral pterygoid muscle and will look like this on coronal imaging. A flail mandible is a fracture that goes through the, roughly the mid portion of the mandible and knocks out both condyles, which makes it difficult for the surgeon uh, to repair this because they need to re restore facial width and facial height. And if your patient doesn't have good dentition, 
Um, it's very difficult to do that without getting hold of old photographs. So, in summary, let's approach this. Uh, we'll start with the paranasal sinuses. If all is clear there, we will look at the nasal bones, zygomatic arches, and mandible. If the sinuses are bloody, uh, I look at the pterygoid plates to see if I'm in Lefort territory or not. Go through the maxillary walls, the orbital walls, and NOE region, uh, zygomatic arches, and then uh, evaluate the soft tissues, particularly around the eyes. So when you have someone that comes in like this, you want to dissect this thing down, and we would call that bilateral Lefort 1s, assuming the pterygoid plates are busted. Keep looking, we have Lefort 2s bilaterally. Keep looking, we go a high horizontal fracture. Going through the arches, we would call that bilateral Lefort 3s. If the pterygoid plates are intact, that might just be called an NOE fracture. And we might also just have them bilateral ZMC fractures, again, if the pterygoid plates would be intact. This is a vertical maxillary fracture, a hard palate fracture, which we didn't particularly get into and this would be a flail mandible. Uh, so that's how we sort of approach these mega smashes here where the only thing that's intact in my resident wants to report, only the occipital bone is intact. Um, and while that's fair, it's easier to sort of dissect this thing down uh, using our approach. So that's it. Thank you very much. Don't get nailed.